Okay, it is five o'clock. We will begin before we get going. Does anybody have any questions from the study from last week? No? We're good to plow ahead? I will have to say, guys, last week was the most boring lesson. So if you can get that through that one okay, you're good to go. It's all uphill or downhill or whatever from here. Uh, so last week we were looking more specifically at translations. Kind of gave you a little bit of something to take to for that. And then we looked at um, the, we started looking at the uh, the interpretive uh, journey is what we called it. Uh, so we will Uh, so we're going to pretty much pick up there. So just to review, um, last week we talked about the two biggest roadblocks to understanding the Bible. Uh, the first roadblock was the translation you use. If you are not using a translation that you understand, get a different translation. I was talking to Jacob, and he said that he uh, got a translation, a different translation, and he's understanding it. So that this is this is what you're looking for. You're looking for a translation you can understand. Um, if it's all in that folder there. If you don't remember any of it, don't worry about it. You can always look back. Um, we also have these lessons recorded. That'll help. Uh, there's the second roadblock we mentioned last week was that you have to, uh, it's kind of where you are at up here, how you approach Scripture. Um, I've seen a lot of people approach it with the mindset of it's wrong. And so then everything that they read, they find holes in it everywhere because they're looking for holes. They're, they can be explained, but they don't want an explanation. Um, I've seen people go to it thinking of themselves as kind of like the master. Like, I'm not here to learn from Scripture. I'm here to kind of correct it and to teach it. And these kinds of things are, that, that's kind of where you are at. So those are the two biggest, um, two biggest issues. And then we looked at the interpretive journey. Um, if you could go to the second slide and skip the first one for right now, we'll come back to the first one. Uh, I, so on this page, this page right here, we, we said that there was a four-step process. You're looking at the text from then and there. What did it mean to them? Um, how, what, what can you do to try to understand as good as the original audience heard it? Then step two was to kind of see what the differences are. We compared this to a river. How wide is that river? Um, what is the difference between then and now? And some of the things that we mentioned was the culture and the language. Uh, and then after that, it was step three. We looked at what was called the principalizing bridge. We, we tried to see, okay, now what's the same? What's the main idea of this passage there? And it kind of takes us uh, right into step four, which is uh, here and now. How does this have to do with us today? Uh, the problem is, is a lot of times we start off on step four. We read the Bible and we, and we instantly say, what does this have to do with me here now today? And when we don't even understand the passage, a huge mistake, huge mistake. So uh, now we'll go back to that first slide there, uh, Grace. So would, did anybody want to share any observations from Acts chapter 1 verse 8? That was your homework from last week. No. No. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm. Okay. So um, everything that you said was good, but remember when we're doing observations, Cut out anything to do with us and our, and just say the disciples. That way it helps you up here to get in the mindset of, of them. But everything you said was right. Uh, you know, it radiated outwards from Jerusalem. Yes, absolutely, everything you just said. So, yes. Any other observations? Don't want to spend, don't want to take too much time, but if you have something, please do share it now, Melissa. Okay, what do you mean? Um, you know, when you look at the 8th century, you see Jesus' face 
Sure, and that's a good application, but remember we're trying to make observations. So if, we're, if we want to make that an observation, we would have to say um, in the text, the, um, the power didn't come from, it came from, you could say it like this, the power in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 came from the Holy Spirit as he came on the disciples. Uh, so yes, what you said, Absolutely. It's just getting into the mindset of using observation words, wordage instead of application. So I want to just recover this. And I, and I, this is a spe- I specifically picked out this homework just to bring to, to the main foreground, I guess you could say, the idea of um, when you're reading the Bible, the first thing we always do when we're reading is we instantly say, how does this apply to me today? Which is exactly what I'm seeing, and it's not that you're doing anything wrong. Okay, you guys were great, great job studying. I'm not not trying to not trying to nitpick or anything. When you go to a passage, you have to go before that pat, that part and say observation, where you're saying what did it mean to them there, not here now me. See what I mean? So it's a whole, whole different mindset that goes to it. And so tonight, <coughs> excuse me. Tonight we're going to focus on some of those things. Um, that will help you to just kind of see that first step of how does this apply to them there. Um, some some different observations that I, I made just in case there were you guys hadn't made any observations. I'm not going to share all of them uh, because I told you guys 20 observations. I'm not going to I'm not going to give you guys 20 observations. But just to, okay. So here's one. Um, God's plan for the disciples was to be witnesses. That's an observation. Um, at the beginning of the, of the verse, it starts out, but, so this tells us that it is somehow connected to the previous verse. The question becomes, what is the relationship between us, not knowing the end of, what, not knowing what age it is, and us receiving power? What's the connection between those two verses? We know that there's some kind of a contrast because it says, but. So that's, that would be an observation there, where you're trying to focus on, on them. Now, I didn't complete these observations because I made them in thinking that just in case you guys didn't make observations to kind of prompt discussion, but you guys already um, had stuff. So, uh, okay, let's go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, do it. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yes. That was a great observation. Yes. Um, let's see. Okay. So I think we're good on that. Now, uh, I just want to mention that the observation that Todd just made, I did not make in my observations. See that? It's always good to get other pe- to talk with it about other people. So let's let's start here with some things before we start reading, and then we'll start looking at the specifics of it. Okay, so when you're reading, there's a few things. First off, read slow. Read slow. Okay, especially if it's a story or a passage you are very familiar with. Read slow. Just slow down. The biggest issue with reading the Bible is we go in... And especially if we're familiar with the Bible, we just kind of blow through it too fast. We don't take time to just stop and say, okay, whoa, 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 what's really going on here? What's being said? Why is it being said? You know, really, what's, what's here? Um, so for that, you want to really pay attention to the details. You want to look at it and say, okay, what, what is here that I'm missing? And, and I'm going to give you a whole list of things to look for in the sentences and the paragraphs and in the discourses. We'll get that in just a second. But first off, read it. So try to think of the Bible like it's a love letter. That really helps. If you pretend like you're a lovesick teenager writing a love letter to your significant other, that will 
drastically improve how you approach the Bible. If you're looking at it for just really paying attention to it, that that right there is where you need to be at. Um, we're going to talk about this in a few weeks, but sometimes we're so hungry for the word to say something to us today that we try to look for metaphors and allegories everywhere. And really, that's why it's really important to stick with the, with the four-step. Um, and we'll talk about this more later, but you see people do this with Song of Solomon, right? I don't know what Song of Solomon has to say to me. So it's just somehow got to be between, be between God and, and me. I don't know. Maybe. And then if you want to see it that way, I just want to throw out a little pet peeve here of mine. This is my own personal thing here, okay? So don't, don't get too carried away. Uh, in the old hymnal song, it talks about him being the lily of the valleys, but that's actually what Solomon says about the girl. So if you're going to say that it's an allegory, you need to at least... Stay true to that allegory, and that would make you the lily of the valley. So, <laughs> there's a little little thing there. Might not it might not matter to any of you guys, but to me, you know, ah, just, ah, one of those things that I it drives me crazy. Just ah, don't don't judge me, okay? But it just drives me a little crazy. Uh, so, okay, you're reading it slow. You are kind of as you read scripture, kind of see it as as a process. Okay, you read it, slow down, let your mind kind of absorb it, kind of think about what you read, and then if you need to, go back and read it again. Did you know it's not about getting brownie points for reading your Bible that day? <laughs> it's, it's, because we do this all the time. Well, I read my Bible today. What did you learn? Oh, nothing, but I read it. Well, I mean, yeah, that's good that you're reading the Bible, but really process what you're reading. Slow down for a second. And uh, then the next thing is, after you've read it, read it again. Read it again. It's okay. It's not like you're going to get cooties from reading it too much or something, you know. Uh, one thing that, that I really like to do, um, especially with the New Testament letters, um, is I like to read it through in one sitting if I can, because that's kind of the mindset that it was written in. You know what I mean? It was like, hey, read this to the church. And they read it. I mean, they they read the whole thing. So if, if you can do that, you can kind of see the flow of the argument. And I think it's a lot easier to kind of see the things that kind of hop out more. Um, and when you read a book m multiple times, you start to noticing some overall ideas that kind of just resurface over and over and over again. For instance, ha has everybody here read First Kings? Okay. Has everybody here also read First Chronicles? Yeah? Okay. So what you got here is First Kings mentions all the bad stuff that people did, <laughs> and First Chronicles just kind of glosses over all the bad stuff. It's kind of <laughs> why does it do that? So then after you've read it again, start reading the whole book. Okay, so you you've read this passage. Okay, I understand this passage that Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Okay, all right. Now I'm going to read the whole book and see kind of how it fits in with that book. Because although the Bible is a book, it is also a book of books, which means that each different book has its own different um, point or uh, thesis, uh, however you want to say. It has its own different feel, its own different vibe. Uh, when you're reading in the book of Job, for instance, there's almost like no description as to what's happening. You've got a bunch of people talking. Like, it doesn't say, and then Job threw the chair. No, it doesn't say that. It just, Job's talking, and then when he's done, now his friend's talking. Now Job's talking. Now his friend's talking. And that's what you get. But then, you know, you go to other parts, and it's being very descriptive about, okay, so Moses went and did this, and he did this to build the, ta the, the, the tabernacle, or the, yeah, the tabernacle. And, you know, so you're going through all these different things of what's happening, and there's no discussion, no talking. You go through the laws, once again, there's no discussion here. There's like, a, hey, this is what you need to do. And it, it's a lot different. So read the whole book, and it kinda, you kind of start to see what that author's point is, or, or writing style is. When you read the Bible, be very careful to read it as though you don't know everything. This is very, very important. When you're reading the Bible, go to it as though you don't. In fact, pretend like you've never read the thing before. What is this? And go down and really study it. Really pay attention to the details. Next off, 
When you read the Bible, our human tendency is to do something like this. This applies to them over there. They could really learn something from this. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, don't think about how it applies to others. Rather, as you're going, kind of pay attention to what can I get from this? You know, what can, what can I do here? Well, oh, no, I don't need to grow in this area. Maybe you do. <laughs> Maybe you do. Um, and then when you're reading it, make sure you go from the immediate outwards. What I mean to say with that is you're reading a passage. You're like, what does this passage mean? Well, start with that sentence and study that sentence. And then study the paragraph. And then study the chapter. And then study the surrounding chapters. And then study the book. So you're, so you're mean, work your way out. And in that, you can kind of catch themes that are being presented and main ideas that kind of switch in the story. And I'll give you some more specific examples as we go on tonight. Um, I'm just kind of introducing these ideas. Uh, and th then the last thing I would say, it's not on your sheet, but you might write it in if you want, uh, or you just remember it. I've always remembered it. Um, forget about the verses and chapters while you read. Just pretend they don't even exist. Um, you can actually buy Bibles where they don't have verses and chapters to them. If you want to do that, whatever. Uh, you can also do uh, just go online, and you can just put it on like a Word document and just backspace all the chapters and verses. You can do whatever you want. More of the story of being, you can just read your regular Bible and just don't pay attention to the verses and chapters. Because this is what we do. When we're reading, we reach the end of the chapter and we say, okay, end of the thought. New thought. The Bible wasn't written that way. It was written as one long thing. So when you get to the chapter, you need to carry on thought. No, this is still connected to that previous thing that I was just reading. See what I mean? So as long as you can do that on your own, you're good. If you can't, make some kind of a note or something where you go to it like that. So, when you are studying, in sentences, this is what you need to look for. First off, repetition of words. When you are studying scripture, look for repetition of words. And when words are repeated frequently, they can oftentimes tell you what the theme is or what the author is getting at. Not always, but it, it sometimes is very helpful. A good example of this is actually St. Corinthians Chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And I'm going to tell you in advance some of the words that are going to be repeated. Comfort, suffering, God. Okay, so let's pay attention. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, you know, pay attention to the words that he's using to describe God. He could use any words to describe God, and these are the ones that he's using. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction or suffering, depending on your translation. Through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Again, God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that as you share in the sufferings, so you all will also share will also share in the comfort. We don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. Then he goes on into here. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength, so that we even despaired of life itself. Again, we were looking at suffering, comfort, suffering, comfort, suffering. Now it comes back to the theme again. It says, we despaired of life itself. Despair being kind of connected with the idea of suffering. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would not trust in ourselves. But in God, again, God, who raises the dead, he has delivered us from such a terrible death, and he will deliver us. So here you have some, not just you have repetition of words, but you have repetition of ideas behind the words. So uh, one, of the, one of the things there is, when you think of suffering and trials, you oftentimes think of death. So he says here, from such a terrible death, that... We are talking about suffering. So even though they're not the same word, it's the same idea being repeated. We have put our hope in him that he will deliver us again while you join in helping us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. So here you see the this, this shift from, com from comfort and suffering to prayers. And he's going to keep on going, but my moral of the story being here, you can see just, just by paying attention to the repetition of words, you can see a main idea here is comfort suffering. How do we get that comfort? 
When do we get that suffering? I mean, sorry, when do we get, get that comforting, comfort? <laughs> Gee whiz. When do we get that comfort? See, when you start asking questions of the text, what does comfort seem to mean? How many times is the word used? How is it used in the, in the way? What modifiers are there to the word? Um, how does it relate to other words such as suffering? Um, are they interconnected? Can you have one without the other? It's different questions like that. You go, to the, you go to the text and you see, well, what does the text have to say about it? And then you start to be able to see uh, your observations right there. Um, the second thing, <coughs> the second thing that you can uh, to look for in sentences is called a contrast. A contrast is, is where you are finding differences. You're finding differences. So this can be uh, about people or things or ideas, uh, but the idea is that two different things are going to be contrasted. And I'm going to give you two examples. The, the first is Proverbs 14.31. Pay attention to this, okay? It says, the one who oppresses the poor, but one who is kind to the needy. So you've got two people there. They're being contrasted, okay? The one who oppresses the poor person insults his maker, but one who is kind to the needy honors him. So you basically have a three-step process here. One who oppresses... I'm sorry. The one who oppresses the poor insults his maker. The one who is kind to the needy honors him. So it's two people, but one is treating this person this way, another one's treating them this way, and the effect is their walk with, with God. So it, it shows kind of what's in the heart. So that would be a contrast. The third one is called a comparison. A comparison is just like a contrast. The difference is instead of contrasts are about differences, comparison is about similarities. So it's basically the same concept. And so once again, this can also be about people, things, or ideas. Nothing different here. Uh, and a good example of that in, is in actually in Proverbs 25, 26. It says, A righteous person who yields to the wicked is like a... So now we have... It's, it, they're, he's going to say something about how these two things are similar. Is like a muddied spring or a polluted well. How? How is it like that? What comparison is actually being made? Okay, so a righteous person... A polluted well. What, 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 what happens? They yield to the wicked person. If they yield, it's like a muddied spring or a polluted well. How is it like a muddied, well, muddied spring or a polluted well? That's the question. What, it, we know that there's a similarity going on, but what is the comparison? Why is it like a polluted well? What, what is it saying? And when you start to kind of slow down and ask these questions, you start to get uh, answers. The problem is, is that a lot of times we don't... Um, we don't really uh, stop to think about it. So uh, another example that I can think of um, from about contrast and comparison, this would actually probably be, probably be contrast, is in the book of Joshua, there is um, a story about this prostitute that lives in a city. Her name's Rahab. And she uh, doesn't want to get killed with the Canaanites. She is a Canaanite. But she doesn't want to die with them. And she understands that God is moving in Israel. She wants that, not this. So she helps out the spies that are working for Israel. And as a result, her life is saved. Now, don't you remember in the law that it says that all the Canaanites should be killed? Don't you remember that? And yet, Joshua starts off the book by showing us Canaanites being saved. This is even more important because right in the middle of that story, there's an Israelite who loses his inheritance. His name is Achan, I think. Uh, that sounds right. Uh, and Achan steals from Jericho before it's destroyed, which God specifically said, don't do that. And he hides the wealth in his house. And so they go to fight the next city after Jericho, which is Ai, maybe. And when they go to fight, this is not a very, very large place. Uh, they are... They're spanked, <laughs> and they go home crying. <laughs> they, they have a really rough time of it. It's, it's not good for them at all. And they're like, well, what is the deal? And they find out they lost because Achan had stolen something from Jericho, which was supposed to have been destroyed. These stories go right alongside each other, and the point of them is to contrast Achan, who was an Israelite who lost his inheritance, 
versus Rahab, who was a Canaanite prostitute who gained an inheritance. And if you go through those two stories and you start looking at the contrast between maybe um, the red garment that was outside of the window uh, versus how Achan, it was hidden underneath his rug in his, in his tent. So you start contrasting these kind of comparisons, and you see that there is definitely a comparison being made between the two. Um, so that would be an example of that. Uh, another example, another, the next thing, which would be four, I think, yeah, four, uh, is lists. A list is anything more than two. Um, sounds simple, except for when you actually get into it. Uh, so when you look at when you look at lists, you have to slow down and ask a couple questions. First off, what is significant about the list? Why are these things mentioned? Why is this important? Second off. Why were these specific things mentioned out of other things that could have been mentioned? Um, and then third off, what is the order of the things listed? Is there an order? Uh, fourth off, uh, how are they grouped or are, are they grouped? These are all important things to know. And so if you look at Galatians, we see an example of that. But the fruit of the Spirit is, you know, he's going to make a list. And the question becomes, is this an exhaustive list? Is it ordered in any certain way? Does it contrast with the later list of the works of the flesh? Um, does it have, uh, has he been talking about these things throughout the book? Is there a theme that's re re <coughs> repeating? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. <clears throat> so once you've asked these kinds of things, you can... Uh, get a much fuller idea of what's going on. A lot of times when you look at lists, you're going to find um, that there is a certain order or that it does relate to the passages around it. And then as you do that, you oh, look at that. This word is, is repeated over here. Well, let's kind of see that. Now, I, I do want to offer a little bit of a word of warning. If you are studying the Bible and you come up with something completely off the wall, think twice. Okay, just... Think twice. There was a woman who um, said, I, you know, I, I, I just really want to hear from God. So I'm reading my Bible backwards, and I'm finding all kinds of things from God. Well, probably not. Probably not. Um, the Bible wasn't written to be read backwards. And out of that, she was reading it in a translation backwards. So it wasn't even in the original language. So once again, this was, whatever she was finding was not an intended meaning of the Bible. When you go to the Bible, you really have to pay attention to what was intended. Because once again, you can really make it say anything you want it to. A uh, very dangerous area to be in. So cause and effect um, is the next one. And cause and effect is pretty, I feel like it's pretty basic. So I didn't, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Romans 6.23 is a, is a good example. For the wages of sin, that's the cause, is death. That's the effect. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Kind of a simple thought. Uh, you're, you're looking for what is the cause and effect. How are these two things related? I mean, it's uh, kind of simple. I'll stop there, though, because we kind of went through a lot of these. Are there any questions about the things that we've looked at? I want to make sure that I'm not going too fast, or maybe I said something I'm not overly clear. That happens more than I'd like to admit. <laughs> We're good? Right, right, exactly. Um, for the sake of the recording, what Melissa said was if you stay with the facts and not opinions, yes, that's exactly the, the idea. If you stay with the facts and not the opinions, you're going to be finding out what it says instead of what I say. So, I mean, that's, that's really what you want to get at, um, especially because we live in a day and age where opinions are kind of equated as fact. In the church and out of the church, it's, it's everywhere in our society. Uh, and that's not not great. Just because you genuinely believe something doesn't mean it's true. So it's one of those things. Um, yes, absolutely. Okay, so figures of speech uh, would be the next one. The biggest thing about figures of speech is usually the most forgotten thing about figures of speech, and that's that they are not literal. A figure of speech is not literal. If you believe the, the Bible is the Word of God, and you believe it for what it says, then that means that sometimes you have to understand that what it says is not literal. 
if you believe that it is the word of God. Okay? It's important if you understand. For instance, and we're going to look at this in a couple weeks. Some parts of the Bible are what's called poetry. They're not going to literally describe a scientific fact. They're going to say it in a way that is poetical. Like maybe talking about uh, God clapping his hands like a tree. Well, God's not a tree, and he's not. Hand, trees don't really have hands. And you see what I mean? But you kind of get the idea, the imagery of the tree waving in the wind with the leaves blowing. You get it. You know what I mean? It's not. It, it, you, you can understand it. And so when you're looking at different stuff, remember that, especially with certain things, it's, it, it's not always literal. One of those things is figures of speech. Figures of speech are not, not, um, not literal. So Psalm 119 is a good example. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. It's not literally a, a lamp, right? Like you don't go outside with the Bible. And, I got my flashlight right here. No, you, you you understand that he's talking. It's a, it's a it's a metaphor, you know. The the it, it's the Bible is is like a lamp for my feet. It guides and directs my paths in life. Um, that I mean, yeah. So I, I say that because there's a lot of times when people kind of go kind of off on stuff. Uh, conjunctions. Now, maybe you're as bad at English as I am in which case you need this explained to you. So I will explain it, okay, because I had a really hard time with English growing up. I actually had a hard time with English until I learned Greek, <laughs> and then I got it. it. It took a long time. English is, and I still say English doesn't make much sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense. But okay, this is the language we're speaking, so I'm going to stick with it. Uh, conjunctions are words such as therefore, since, because. Okay, um, yeah, so if you look at Romans 12, when it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God. And so the, the, the thing about conjunctions, and I'm going to use specifically the conjunction therefore, whenever a therefore is there, look to see what it's there for. You'll always see what, what's the preceding thought, what's the preceding verse. Because uh, the, the verses weren't written to be verses. It was written to be a part of a whole. Um, it's all good and well to, re to memorize a verse, but remember that there is a context there. Um, yeah, so. Um, in this case, Romans 12, when it says, therefore, in, in view of the mercies of God, what is he talking about? If you go to the previous verse, you're not going to find what he's talking about because he's summarizing 11 chapters that he's been looking at theology and very deep theology that are still have scholars thumped, stumped today. So, I mean, this is not something that we're just taking a little le leisurely cruise on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and so because of all of those 11 chapters, therefore, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to do this. Um, so in, in that case, what, he, what he's doing is in ch chapters 1 through 11, he's talking about their beliefs, and now he's going to start talking about their action. Before he was talking about who we are, and now he's going to talk about what we should do. Um, before he was talking about... Um, well, I could say it like this instead. We do this because he did that. So now that you've kind of put the two pieces, that makes the whole of the book of Romans. But as you're reading it, it doesn't come out across that way. You never, you never hit a point in the book of Romans that says you're at the halfway point. You're just going, and then you're talking about Israel and what's Israel's place in history and, and, and all this stuff. And then out of nowhere, he hits you with this. Uh, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And it's like, okay, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about about the Jews or any of that. <laughs> I got the idea that we're sinners. I got that. But then you lost me out around chapter 9. And then, so here we are now. So long story short, I'm a sinner, so present my body as a sacrifice. I don't, whatever. See what I mean? And I know I'm not the only person who did that, so don't look at me like you don't know. What, that's exactly what we do. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 is another good example. It says, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud, uh, uh, cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Well, in chapter 11, he gives a bunch of different examples of those witnesses. He goes through, excuse me, he goes through Abraham and Moses and Sarah and some others. Uh, and then in 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 8, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or, or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel relying on the power of God. So once again, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. So there's something for that verse that has uh, impact on this verse. 
So we looked at repetition of words, contrast and comparison, um, lists, cause and effect, figure of speech, conjunctions. Now we're at verbs, and there's only two more things that we're going to talk about in the sentences. Verbs and pronouns. So the thing about verbs is most of us know what a verb is. I mean, they're the action word. They're the thing that gets something done, right? I command you. I'm commanding. That's I'm, I'm, There's an action going on. I ran to the store. There's an action that's going on. Um, all the all the action of a sentence is in the verbs. So we all know that. But the thing is, when we're reading the Bible, there's a few things to focus, kind of remember. First off, what tense is the verb? Um, there's you got past, something that already is completed. You got present, something that's ongoing. You got future, something that will happen. So what tense is the verb? Um, Greek is a little bit more uh, helpful when it comes to verbs. English isn't quite so. Um, helpful, so you kind of have to uh, pay a little bit closer of attention to the way that it's translated because it's kind of sometimes hard to follow. But with that being said, uh, you you can still ask the same questions more or less. Uh, is it ongoing or is it finished? I already mentioned that. Is it a command? Is it active or passive? Now, the, the only way I can say of to get this across in English. Uh, is probably the simplest way. Um, okay, so an active verb is something that you are doing. A passive verb is when something is being done to you. Yeah. So, um, always ask those kinds of questions when it comes to verbs. Uh, Colossians 3 1 gives us kind of an example of this. So, if you have been raised, that, that right there translates one word, have been raised. Um, if I remember correctly, <laughs> I, d I didn't go and translate this, uh, so I'm just going off of my memory. With Christ, Seek, there's another verb, the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And so then we get to pronouns, the last thing that to really pay attention for them and to mention in uh, sentences. And when you go through your sentences in the Bible, you can take this list and just start saying, oh, okay, I'm going to look for repetition of words and just read through it and say, are there any repetitions of words? And then go to the next thing, are there any contrasts? You know, and if that's what it takes to get you to slow down, that's okay. Um, especially if you're having a hard time understanding a verse. Read it through 10 or 15 times. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but pronouns is, is what's next. Uh, and a pronoun is basically you, he, so on and so forth, uh, whoever. <clears throat> there's different kinds of pronouns, you know, like relative pronouns and stuff. But it's, it's not really important for you to know that, just as long as you know to look out for them. So note them and, and, and kind of pay attention to them and, uh, and pay, kind of patient to, to pay attention to what they are referring to. Um, this is a little bit hard in English, in English because in Greek it'll say plural, there'll be plural or singular. But in English it's like you is the same as you. You know what I mean? Well, in Greek you don't have that problem. Uh, a lot of times, other, other times too, in, if you're reading through a text, it'll say something along the lines of, he was talking to this person, and then he talks to this person. Now, in Greek, the ending of the word helps you know what's going on, but in English, it doesn't always come across. So that brings me to a little point that I'm trying to make. If you're having a hard time with one specific part, read a couple different translations and see how they word it and see if that helps figure it out. Um, if that doesn't, just kind of pay attention to the main flow of the argument, and it kind of kind of kind of uh, makes it come out a little bit clearer. Um, a good example of this would be uh, in John. It says that he whipped them. Did he whip the animals or did he whip the people? It doesn't really come across, does it? <laughs> so you got kind of got to pay attention to what's being said and what the rest of the what the rest of the verses have to say. So. Ephesians 1, 3 is a good example of this. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll slow down. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. So the question being, who is us and are? So when you, when you kind of slow down and, 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 and ask those questions, you get, uh, once again, you get clearer, clearer answers. The reason, well, a lot of times, why we don't get good answers to our Bible studies studies is because we're not asking good questions. We're blowing through it too fast. If you just slow down, you, you'll get it. Um, a lot of the Bible isn't complicated. It's just that it's complicated if you've already got your mind made up. 
You know, like, that's one of the big problems I had with Hebrews when I first started studying Hebrews a number of years ago, is uh, I already knew what I believed, and then I read Hebrews, and it was just causing me to have a lot of confusion, because that's not what I believed. So I had to kind of, what? You know what I mean? So, um, Colossians, here's a good example. Um, We all oftentimes hear people talk about how we celebrate or observe the Sabbath. Everybody talks about it. Christians talk about it all the time. Sunday is the Sabbath day and all this. Different. Well, it's not. First off, the Sabbath day is Saturday. Second off, Christians don't observe the Sabbath. Colossians actually specifically says, don't let somebody talk you into observing the Sabbath. It says that. Uh, you know, if, if they want to observe the Sabbath and the holy days, that's up to them. But don't let somebody else convict you on it. It's, it says that in Colossians. So if you already have your mind made up, no. Sabbath is Sunday, and Christians observe the Sabbath. No, we don't. Jesus never once, and Paul never once, revalidated the Sabbath. In fact, if you read through every single one of the Ten Commandments, Jesus took time to revalidate, except for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the only one that he never did. And the reason why, (laughs) among other reasons, that's a whole discussion on how we're free from the law, but we'll move on from that and just say, is because Christians don't observe the Sabbath. There is no holy day anymore. So this is a very important point because we look forward to the coming Sabbath, which is the day of rest, which is heaven, the new heavens and new earth. It's kind of a big theme in the New Testament. If you don't understand that, you're not going to understand a lot of what's being said in the Old Testament and the New Testament because you're still thinking, I am partially under the Mosaic Law. And as long as you're thinking that, you're not, you're not going to get the rest of it. But we'll look at that more in a couple weeks. Um, the, that, that takes us to paragraphs. And when you're reading paragraphs, uh, there's quite a few things uh, to look out for. The first is an an argument from general to specific. Um, So this is kind of where you introduce something and you kind of build on it. So let me kind of give you an example in Galatians 5.16. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's That's a general, okay? Now the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, moral impurity, and these these are specific. So it goes from general to specific. And then uh, next up, look for uh, questions and answers, more or less, you know, obvious. The, the thing you need to know, though, is that um, there are some questions that are not interactive, they're rhetorical, and in Greek, you usually word it in a way that the answer is obvious in the text. Um, so there's two ways you can translate that. You can leave it unanswered and just assume that the reader will figure it out, or you can add words to scripture and give the answer that is implied in Greek. Because English is sometimes hard to uh, relay an implied meaning. Greek has a lot of implied meaning and implied words, and English doesn't have that. Uh, So, okay. Um, And then when you get to questions, remember questions are asked for a reason. Uh, We blow through questions, but they are asked for a reason. Read through Mark, and you're going to notice that in chapter 2, there's a series of five questions that are answered. Four uh, qu- questions that are asked. Four are answered, one are not. Four are from the Pharisees, one is not. Then you get to the end of Mark, and you're going to find the exact same pattern. Five questions being asked. Four are answered, one is not. Four are from the Pharisees, one is not. You see this exact same pattern on both sides of Mark. So the, the questions are there for a reason. Um, they are important to slow down and pay attention to. And why was this question asked? What is the answer revealing? So Romans 6 one says, What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Um, then next up would be dialogue. And dialogue is very much so connected with question and answers. But you'll kind of figure that one for yourself as you're reading through. Uh, and the thing is, with, with, with dialogue, you kind of have to slow down for a little bit because um, some things aren't overly clear when you're reading it through too quickly. Who is talking and to who? Or to whom? Who is talking and to whom? What is the setting? Are there others and are they listening to the conversation? Is it an argument, a lecture, a discussion, or simply talking? What is the point that this dialogue was uh, included, written down, r- recorded? Uh, and then remember next up that emotions are not recorded. It doesn't say, and then Jesus said, sadly. Or, and Jesus in a somber voice said, 
See, it doesn't say that. It doesn't tell us what, what, what the emotion is in the text. So there's kind of a warning here. That you, you be careful that you aren't reading into it. Something it's not actually saying or not reading into it. <laughs> so what I mean by that is sometimes we can see something that's not there, and sometimes we just don't even pay attention, oblivious. Uh, a good example of that is when your wife says, hey, uh, it's in the fridge, and you say, I don't think so. <laughs> No. Come on. Mark 10, 18 says, Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him, No one is good except God alone. So the question becomes, Why? What, what, what is going on right here? Why is God? At, why did Jesus ask that question? And then what is the emotion that he's trying to convey in this? What, what's going on? So what people do nowadays is they say, Well, obviously he's saying that he's not God. Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure you aren't reading too much into that? Uh, or maybe you're not reading correctly into it, is a better way of saying it. What is being said, and why is it being said? These are very important things. So two examples, or three examples I can give um, from dialogue that are very important. The book of Habakkuk and the prophets is entirely a dialogue. It's happening between the prophet Habakkuk and God. Habakkuk gives a complaint. Hab- uh, God gives an answer. Habakkuk gives another complaint. God gives an answer. And then Habakkuk gives a, okay. And that's the entire book. And if you read it through, you can kind of pay attention to the dialogue. Job is another dialogue. It's not, you're not going to see Job walked here or he crossed the river. No, no. It's just dialogue, then answering dialogue and back and forth. Um, another example would be Jesus and the Pharisees multiple times throughout pretty much all the, Fer- all the Gospels. There's going to be long excerpts where there's no action going on. They just switch to dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees or somebody else. Um, next up would be purpose statements. I love how it puts statements up there. <laughs> purpose statements. <laughs> Uh, these are just simple statements that tell us why something is happening. So if you look in Deuteronomy 6.3, it says this, Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them, so that you may prosper and multiply greatly. This is a purpose statement. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So these are purpose statements. The next up would be means. And a means is basically answers the question, how? How did that happen? What was the means that that happened? Psalm 119, look, look at this. It says, how can a young man keep his way pure? Okay, there is, the, there is the, the, the purpose question, okay? And here you have the means, by keeping your word. So you have the, the, the means, the, the how something is accomplished. Now, obviously, it's not always going to be that, e- that easy to find uh, when you're reading Scripture. Just keep going. Um, conditional clauses is next. And these are basically terms and conditions of your Apple software. Uh, if this, then that. Uh, so the important thing to remember about conditional clauses. Nowadays, people use conditional clauses as threats. If you don't pick up your toys, I'm going to. But in the Bible, that's not really the idea. Uh, conditional clauses in the Bible aren't threats. God's not an angry parent who's just so frustrated that he's not getting his way. That's No. Uh, it's more of consequences. Um, in the Bible, conditional clauses are, are more of con- consequences. If you do this, this is the consequence that's going to happen from that. So, I mean, you can do that if you want. This is the consequence. And then we live by those consequences. Um, so a good example of this would be 1 John 1, 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. So here's the condition. If we say this and yet we walk in the darkness, we are lying. Another good example would be Moses. Law, pretty much the whole thing. It says, hey, if you remember me and, and, and honor me throughout the generations and you, you know, don't forget to do these things, then I'm going to bless you. My blessings are going to overtake you. A bunch of good stuff's going to happen. But if you don't, and if you decide to worship idols and do all that stuff that I told you not to do, then this is going to happen. <clears throat> so, uh, the next one, and we're just got, I think, two or three more. Three. Three more. So, uh, actions of the... <laughs> I, I, I typed that wrong. The idea is, um, what is the role of, of the person versus what is the role of God? 
Um, so let me give you an example. Um, uh, Ephesians 5.1.2. Therefore, be imitators of God. That, that's your role. So God is the one being imitated. You're the one imitating. As dearly loved children and walk in love, as Christ also loved and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So we have Christ... It's Christ's role to be the, to be a sacrifice and a fragrant offering to God, but that's also now our role because we're imitators. So we aren't dying for people's sin, but we are living that same process of being a sacrificial offering to God because we're following the example that He set for us. Our life is not our own. Um, so the idea is: who does what? Is there a connection between who is doing what? Um, Next up, the, we're on the last two now, emotional terms. Emotional terms are any th- ideas or words that carry emotional overtones. Uh, what feelings are being expressed and why are those feelings being expressed? Why those words specifically? Look at, for instance, in Galatians. He says, I beg you, brothers and sisters, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have not wronged me. You know that previously I preached, um, I preached the gospel to you because of a weakness of the flesh. You did not despise or reject me through my physical condition was a trial for you. I'm sorry. Uh, Though my physical condition was a trial for you. On the contrary, you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. He's not being literal. Okay, He's, He's being expressive. You received me as if I was an angel of God. As Christ Jesus himself, where then is your blessing? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have torn out your very eyes and given them to me. Look at the, look at the words he's saying. Torn out your eyes. I beg you. So then how have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? Very, very expressive words being used there. You can kind of pick up on the emotion of the moment, maybe frustration. Maybe a little bit of anger, maybe a little bit just hurt and sad because of the situation. So then the next one would be the tone. Uh, this is the last of the last of the things I'm going to mention about the paragraph. The tone is the overarching idea. Like it's uh, it's obviously connected with the emotional terms, the previous one, but it's more of the overarching uh, emotion behind the thing. So for instance, look at Lamentations. Uh, where is it? Uh, we'll start with Galatians. You foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by the Spirit, are you now finished by the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing, if in fact it was for nothing? Now compare that to Lamentations. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of God's wrath. He has driven me away and forced me to walk in darkness instead of light. Yes, he repeatedly turns his hand against me all day long. He has worn away my flesh and skin. He has broken my bones. He has laid siege against me, encircling me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have been dead for ages. Do you see the tone of the, of, of the scripture? So you got Galatians, which was very uh, reprimanding. Then you got Lamentations, which is just grief. Just grief. Completely different tones. <clears throat> and if you pay attention to the emotional words that are used, it kind of goes with that. Uh, we might not be able to finish tonight. Don't worry. We'll stop right at 6 and we're however far we get, however far we get. Uh, so, uh, so when you get to discourses, um, I think of discourses kind of like as a lengthy speaking section or um, you could say in some context, maybe a long story. Um, so the first thing is a connection between episodes or paragraphs. Uh, and for that, you kind of pay attention to the themes that are being presented. Um, you know, there's going to be logical connections, how the parts are connected to the whole, uh, how the observations illuminate the text, so on and so forth. Um, you know, like, for instance, stopping and saying, okay, what are the repeated words that we looked at? What are the themes and all that stuff? But beyond that, just looking for how the, how the parts connect to the whole. So uh, I looked at this in Wednesday night. Um, I'm just going to bring it up as a real quick one. 
Um, if you were here, you already know. When you're reading through Matthew uh, 18, you've got 15 through 20, which is the, the passage everybody remembers. If your brother sins against you, do this. And you got that passage. Everybody knows that passage. So then you've got the passage before it where he's talking about how the Christians are like children. They're like little ones. And he mentions that don't despise one of these little ones. Don't lead them astray. And he gives an example of the lost sheep. And you start to see God's heart in those who are lost. And then you get to verse 15. It's talking about how you are trying to bring someone who's gone astray back. And then you get to verse 21 through 35. And he goes to this long story to answer one of Paul's questions, which is, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? So you start to see this overarching theme and you can see that the passages before and after the verse, the verses about correcting somebody, are about how you correct somebody, the attitude behind it. So uh, the next thing would be a story shift. Um, story shifts are something significant that changes the flow of what's going on. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, so different words are going to be used in the different parts. Uh, different themes are going to come up. Different topics are going to come up. Um, I can't remember where, maybe Ephesians, but the first half of the book is talking about uh, th all the verbs are in this tense. And then you get to the second half of the book, and all the verbs change tense. And the reason for that is because he's trying to draw uh, kind of a, well, it's a story shift. He's trying to draw attention to something. I think it's Ephesians. It's a good idea for Bible study if you guys are looking for something. Uh, so uh, a good example of a story shift is the book of 2 Samuel, the entire thing. Okay, the first half of 2 Samuel, it's talking about King David and how great he is. All the great thing he's, things he's doing, how you know he's conquering every enemy on every side. Then the second half of the book is just about all of King David's inadequacies and failures. What in the world happened? Well, chapter 11 and 12 happened. David uh, has an affair with uh, one of his friend's wife. <laughs> and everything from that point on changes. The whole tone of the book changes. The first, hey, everything's great and hunky-dory, you get, you get to that event. And then and the whole rest of the book, it's all downhill. And you see the family's not getting along, a bunch of people are dying. It, 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 just, it, it does not look good for King David. And uh, so that would be a story shift. Another ex uh, example of a story shift would be Colossians. You start reading Colossians, it's talking about theology, and you're like, what in the world does this have to do with anything? And then halfway through the book, he starts changing and just says, hey, by the way, this is how it applies to you. Oh. It's almost abrupt. And if you're not paying attention to the, li to the literary writing style, it's just going to kind of throw you off. Um, so uh, the next one would be interchange. Interchange is really cool. Uh, it's usually used in narrative, and it's meant to, you have two different stories that are going on kind of at the same time, and you kind of switch between the two. Uh, if you read fiction books, you're going to see this quite a lot. It's actually in the Bible, too. Um, and the reason why you do this is usually to, con to contrast between two, two uh, storylines. So if you read in, uh, uh, I think it's 1 Samuel. I hope it's 1 Samuel. I'm telling you it's 1 Samuel, so I hope it is. Uh, Eli, the priest is not doing his job well. And he has God's about to, about to judge him and his whole household. And then you have Hannah, who for all intents and purposes, it looks like she's being judged by God. But you, as you go through the story, you see that these two characters are being contrasted. Eli with his wicked sons and Hannah with her righteous son. Um, you know, Eli not hearing from God and Hannah hearing from God. And you see this contrast between these two people. That's, that's an interchange. Um, and so, yeah. And the last one I want to mention is called a chiasm. Um, chiasm is a really cool thing that you don't really see in English. Um, here on the screen I have an example of it. It's A, B, C, D, C, B, A. Okay, so the idea is you have contrasting parallel items used with the main focus usually, but not always. So I'm going to give you two examples because that's probably you're probably going to say, what did you just mean? What did you just say? <laughs> Let me kind of clarify. Psalm 76.1 is a chiasm. In Judah, in Israel, that's how it starts, that's how it ends. In Judah, God is known. You got A, B. His name is great. B again, in Israel, A. So he has that repeating pattern. Okay, goes this way, then it goes backwards. Um, another good example of a longer uh, version of a chiasm is from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. It's really small on the screen, so you're going to have a hard time seeing it. Uh, but the idea is the story of the Tower of Babel. 
I mean, most people who grew up in the church know the story, uh, but one thing that's easy to overlook is that it's actually a chiasm. Uh, it starts and ends the same way, and the whole focus of the story is, is the verse, but the Lord came down. So you've got the whole world, and it ends the whole earth. Had one language, the Lord confused the language. They lived in Shinar and settled there. Babel, because there, that's where the, the name of the city was called Babel, is because there this happened. Come, let's make bricks, they said. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, God said. They built a city with a tower. God wanted to see the city and the tower, but the Lord came down. So if you read it, as it's written in Genesis, the whole world had one language, lived in the, in the land of Shinar and settled there. Come, let's make bricks, they said. Come, let us build a city with a tower, but the Lord came to see the city and the tower that the men were building. Come, let us go down and confuse their language. Ba uh, uh, I forget how it's worded in the verse, but uh, they called it Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. So yeah, it kind of starts and ends on the same po same thing. And the main, the middle verse in those things is usually the the highlight or the focus. I believe it's Saint Corinthians, if I remember correctly. Chapters one through nine is a big chiasm. Uh, I don't want to ruin it for you, but if you go go back and read Saint Corinthians, you're gonna start seeing and noticing it. So. Uh, that's the idea behind a chiasm. And I have on your sheet, I, I, or in your hands, I, I think, I gave you a little trial uh, page that shows a chiasm on it. Um, it's not a very witty chiasm. <laughs> it's just to show you the idea behind it because it really does appear all throughout Scripture. Um, a few last things, and once it hits 6 o'clock, I'll stop. Uh, once you spot these things that, I, that we've gone through in tonight's lesson, figure out what is significant about them. Stop and say, what does it matter that, you know, there's repetition of words and all these different things? Start with these things that I showed you tonight in step one when you're looking for observations. And, um, and, and don't rush too quickly to two things. Don't rush too quickly to an application. Stay and enjoy the text. Study it. Pay attention to it. Just slow down. It's okay. It's a journey. It's fun. Uh, and then, uh, you know, with that being, being said, don't rush... Uh, to a commentary or some study aid. Sometimes we get frustrated with a passage and so we go and find out what somebody else has to say or we go online and look for an answer real quick and we miss the opportunity of God speaking to us uh, in our uh, study time. And it is 6 o'clock so I'm stopping. Kind of abrupt, huh? <laughs> uh, I have uh, there that I've given you this little sheet. We were going to start working on it. But alas, I have talked too long. So we'll not be working on it. Uh, you are welcome to work on it throughout the week. Um, and we can talk about it next week instead. Oh, if you don't want to work on it throughout the week, we'll just talk about it next week. So do whatever you want. And uh, any questions as I wrap up? So <laughs> that's, that's a good question. In, in the original text, uh, there weren't even spaces. In, in Greek, there were no, 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 no spaces. It was just a long run on word after word, which caused a lot of confusion, let me tell you. <laughs> but, I mean, most, that's all been figured out now. But, uh, no. And then in Hebrew, um, I'm not sure because my Hebrew is extremely weak. Extremely weak. Um, I know uh, a little bit of the alphabet. I understand that it goes from right to left instead of left to right. And I understand some of the concepts behind some of the words. But I do not no Hebrew, so I'm not sure about Hebrew. But Greek was originally, not only did it not have verses and chapters, but it didn't even have spaces or, or, or periods uh, that was all added uh, afterwards. So, how about that, huh? <laughs> how would you like to read a book with no spaces or periods? <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? In the words of John Wayne, any more questions you want to ask? Are we, do we have John Wayne fans? or No? Danny? Okay, you know what I'm thinking. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you guys for giving your time to be here. Really. And uh, let me pray for you guys, and you can go do whatever you want to do. Lord, I pray that you would bless those who are here who are just trying to learn more about your word. I pray that you would uh, help them as they study, help them to hear from you, help them to pay attention to the details, help them to just have a good time in their Bible study and to see the joy that comes in Bible study and just how fun it is uh, to see new life in an old verse. Uh, and Lord, that you just be with them as they go throughout the week and bless them. We love you, Lord. Amen.